Ann Chandler, and I am with the Houston Office of the Tahereh Justice Center, a national organization with offices in Washington, D.C., Baltimore, San Francisco, and Houston that protects immigrant women and, and children who are fleeing violence. And it's really an honor to moderate this panel today um, with four panelists that I admire greatly that are really on the front lines of doing fabulous work. Um, and it, I'll have an opportunity to um, ask questions so that they can share their creativity and their vision for really ensuring that asylum seekers and refugees have access to protections that are guaranteed in our international and um, national laws. We will be well served if my introduction is very short so that I can move forward with asking questions about you know, the policies and practices that we're seeing, such as the militarization of the border, um, the way expedited removal is both structured and being implemented, and the use of detention really is a deterrence policy um, to ensure that individuals who are fleeing violence frequently are not given the opportunity to genuinely have real access to resources and councils and an environment which they can represent their claim. Um, we're gonna spend the first part of talking about what is happening right here and now on the US border and in our detention centers. And then we'll be moving to talk about in a more broader sense, picking up on the, on the, the, the our general brilliant theme of the conference of mobilizing resources and coherent community responses to really look at lessons that we've learned um, on resisting the policies put in place with the refugee travel ban, as well as lessons we've learned from really the heroic responses of fighting family detention that, and the victories that have been made and the efforts that are ongoing so that we can build bridges across um, untraditional lines and to mobilize forces to be the most effective in this fight to ensure that individuals who are fleeing violence truly, truly have access to relief. So without more ado, I wanna turn to Clara. Thank you for coming um, from the San Francisco, Oakland area. Clara is a longtime researcher, producer of um, documentaries who has um, shared quite a bit um, throughout her life on human rights abuses in Latin America and what's happening on the border. Could you do us a favor of just diving in with what is expedited removal, what's its history of it, and, and what does it look like today for an individual seeking asylum at our border? Yeah, um, thanks so much for having me here. It's a real pleasure. Uh, I have worked a, a lot in Latin America, but actually what I do now is the US program at Human Rights Watch, which is actually the largest program at, at Human Rights Watch uh, covering a single country. Uh, we focus on U.S. human rights abuses, uh, and the story of expedited removal is a story of those abuses. Um, and I think it's important to sort of lay out this context for the rest of the discussion so we really have a, something of a historical vision of um, what we're fighting today. Prior to 1996, there really was no way for U.S. officials to remove people without sending them uh, in front of an immigration judge. So without providing them um, with some small level of due process. And when I use the word remove, I'm using it in the legal sense. I'm using it in the sense of a formal deportation, which under US law carries a lot of consequences, uh, potential bans, um, being opened up to potential further criminal prosecution if you come back again. Prior to 1996, um, if you came to the border, you often just got turned around. Uh, most of the people who crossed the U.S.-Mexico border outside of the ports of entry were Mexican, uh, and most of them just got sent back to Mexico uh, in what they called you know, a voluntary return, which was not really voluntary, but, um, but that didn't carry these consequences, these legal consequences that a formal deportation would. And in 1996, uh, as a precursor to Donald Trump's uh, work scapegoating immigrants, uh, the United States Congress uh, wanted to respond to the bombing of the Oklahoma City Federal Building by a natural born US citizen 
Um, and so they blamed immigrants. And they passed two laws that, um, that drastically changed the immigration laws and, and are, are really a huge part of why things look the way that they do today. These laws did a lot of things. It, they made uh, it much more, uh, it made it much easier to be deported uh, if you were a green card holder uh, for, any, for any of a wide number of criminal convictions. They made detention uh, a, a resort, that's something that the government could resort to uh, in many more cases. And they made, um, a, the, uh, they made expedited removal a reality. And they made these fast track deportation procedures where people did not have to go in front of a judge, but instead a U.S. immigration official could interview them uh, in keeping with the U.S.'s obligations under uh, international refugee uh, treaties and U.S. law, um, determine if they had a fear of returning to their country, and if the official determined that they did not have a fear, then to just basically sign their official deportation order and to send them back. After 1996, though, the expedited removal wasn't really rolled out to the full extent of the law. In fact, it started being used only at airports, where people would come in, and p officials at airports would often would say, oh, you don't have the correct documentation. We're going to apply an expedited removal to you. Uh, that raised lots of concerns for asylum seekers already. And in fact, by 2005, a U.S. government agency called the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, which uh, had the responsibility of, uh, of, of, of investigating this process, did a multi-year, multi-hundred page study about the practice of expedited removal at airports. Um, they concluded that it was, uh, it was a disaster for asylum seekers who came into airports, that it did not protect their rights, and that the government should seriously consider not using it anymore. In response, the government rolled it out across the entire border. <laughs> so since 2005, um, instead, not just, it, it's been, uh, expedited removal is applied not just at airports, but across the, the areas between ports of entry and of course at ports of entry along the US-Mexico border. That means that, um, People who uh, are, are caught now, coming from Mexico, Central America, or many other places around the globe, are placed into this, this, uh, this procedure. Uh, about 80% to 90% of the people who go through the border are being placed into expedited removal. It is a big deal. It is a huge part of the number of deportations that President Obama's administration accomplished. Um, and the reason why uh, the Obama administration was able to deport almost three million people is in large part because of summary deportation and in large part because of expedited removal. There are a few other flavors of summary deportation as you all may know in, in, in US immigration law. Um, when we talk about deterrence, we have to place expedited removal squarely in the, the center of what the US government thinks it's doing with respect to, to deterrence. Expedited removal being rolled out across the entire border is part of what DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, calls its consequence delivery system, which is my favorite name of a government program. Um, it is part of a system in which uh, border patrol agents are directed to apply a consequence to everyone who crosses the border, the idea being that a voluntary return is not a consequence. That consequence can be an expedited removal, that consequence can be referral for prosecution for illegal entry or re-entry, and until recently, um, I, uh, it could be um, being repatriated laterally, say you crossed in from Tijuana and you're repatriated back to Texas. So expedited removal itself is deeply intertwined with this idea of deterrence, the idea that by applying a consequence, uh, people will stop coming across the border. I'm going to say one or two more things about what that process looks like, and then I'm, I'll sort of pass it off. Um, but <clears throat> I want to emphasize that the process itself involves first a, a screening interview, usually with a Border Patrol agent or a Customs and Border Protection Office of Field Operations agent. And in that screening, they're required to ask by regulation four, four questions about whether or not the person has fear of return to their country, whether or not they fear being persecuted, um, and 
whether um, and, and, and whether they uh, fear being tortured. The answer to those questions are recorded on a form that is styled as a sworn statement before a law enforcement official. What we have found, and what many other groups have found, is that these sworn statements are essentially falsified on a mass scale. Uh, the US Commission on International Religious Freedom, our friends from 2005, released last year a follow-up report in which they reported that they observed uh, U.S. government border patrol officials basically copy pasting one statement from one person to the next person. And I think Manoj may be able to speak to how similar every single, nearly every single one of these sworn statements are um, when they come out, uh, when, they, when they come to family detention. Um, people always say they come to work. People never say that, well, very rarely are recorded as saying they have fear. And that matters uh, for two main reasons. One, it matters because being recorded as having fear determines whether you're passed on to the next step in the asylum seeking process. So if uh, an official at the Border Patrol takes your statement, you say you have, you're afraid of returning, but the official writes down that you're not afraid of returning, which happens too often, uh, then you will not be referred to a credible fear interview, or if you're in something called reinstatement of removal, a reasonable fear interview. Um, that means that you may not ever get the chance to make your claim, and you may de be deported back to a place where you can be harmed. Um, you may also, as a side note to that, have a chance later on, and, and in fact, we, what we've found is that most people do, who, most people who actually are able to claim, uh, make a claim for asylum in expedited removal are not flagged by the Border Patrol. Um, we uh, found in a data analysis from 2012 that three quarters of the people who actually do end up in credible fear interviews are coming from ICE. So they're finding some other official in an informal way to say, hey, I'm, I'm actually really afraid. Can you, can you help me? Uh, can I get a credible fear interview? And then um, another consequence, just back to these sworn statements and the falsification of these sworn statements, another consequence that has is that these are sworn statements by law enforcement officials that are admissible in a court of law. And um, that means that people um, like Manoj, or like Steve, or, or like Nicole may, and this may not happen in every case, because many people know how uh, unreliable these documents are, but that many people are having to explain to an immigration judge why they supposedly said that they weren't afraid when they entered the country. Um, so I'll leave it there about, um, about the sort of background and practice of expedited removal. One thing I want to say that um, before, I, before I end is that President Trump's administration has promised to expand expedited removal. And that's part of the reason that's so important that we're talking about this today. Uh, the uh, executive orders uh, released in, in January and the DHM, DHS memo released after that promised to file with the Federal Register changes that would expand the reach of this practice. Right now it's available only to officials who apprehend somebody within 100 miles of the border who cannot prove that they've been here for more than 14 days. Uh, the full reach of the law could be to apply expedited removal to people apprehended anywhere in the country and who cannot prove that they have been here more than two years. So it's important for us to strategize about this um, because it could be um, like the, like the Muslim ban, uh, something that we need to respond to on a massive scale. Clara, thank you for that. And thank you for reminding okay, us okay. That, that, in fact, the president has that full intent of expanding expedited removal to the statutory breadth that our Congress passed in 1996. And why I think we should all really hesitate at this is going to be exemplified, I think, in um, our words and experiences from Nicole Ramos, who thank you for coming up from Tijuana, Mexico, and thank you for your really um, groundbreaking work supporting asylum seekers in their effort to cross the U.S.-Mexico border and exercise their rights in explaining their fear and getting through CBP so they can actually ask for asylum in the United States. Nicole is the project director of the Border Rights Project of um, Alo Trovado. So thank you, Nicole, and if you could just dig into your work on a daily basis. 
Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Um, as Anne mentioned, I am based in Tijuana, Mexico, and uh, I am right by the San Isidro border crossing, which is the largest transited border crossing in the world. Um, Tijuana itself is a city of immigrants and migrants, um, and we have a very high refugee population there. Um, what we do as a border rights project is we go into the shelters and the churches that are, are housing all of refugees that are coming with the intention to seek asylum at the border. Um, we do Know Your Rights presentations and we identify asylum seekers that are interested in presenting themselves in US, to U.S. authorities at the port of entry. Um, why do we do this? Um, Title 8, Section 1225 of the United States Code gives people the right when they interact with an immigration officer, including um, Border Patrol and Customs and Border Protection officers in the port of entry, um, if, they, if they go up to one of these officers and tell them, I am afraid, um, I want to seek asylum, uh, something to that effect, it's supposed to trigger a referral process, and that person is supposed to be referred by the CBP officer to um, an asylum officer for a credible fear interview during which time um, you know, they're, they have the discretion to detain them by ICE or to grant them a humanitarian parole at the border and, and have those proceedings follow after they enter the, the country. What we're seeing, um, what we've been seeing for a long time at the port of entry is CBP officers refusing to follow that law. So asylum seekers um, will go and present themselves and CBP will say things, um, asylum, you know, oh, you, you can't do that here. Um, you have to go to the consulate or the embassy in your own country. Um, it, at, or following the election of Trump, what we're seeing is people being told, well, we're not taking people like you. Um, we're taking uh, Christians who are being persecuted in Muslim-majority countries. Um, asylum it was canceled for Mexicans, apparently. Um, I don't know if any of you know this. Um, <laughs> So, you know, we're seeing a lot, a lot of really interesting statements coming from CBP officers, and we're seeing them um, even though they're going to the port of entry with counsel, which is me, um, even though I'm going to the port of entry with the federal statute highlighted um, in case, you know, no one wants to look through the whole thing. The main important part of their job is highlighted for them. Um, and what I'm getting from officers and from supervisors and, and um, chiefs at the port of entry is, is complete and total um, rebellion and refusal to follow the law. In Tijuana, we have a really interesting system that the Mexican government and the U.S. government collaborated to put together, although both of those governments publicly deny any collaboration. Um, and that requires, requires asylum seekers to go to Mexican immigration and obtain a interview ticket in order to be seen by CBP officers, um, which is cr incredibly interesting given the human rights record of Mexico uh, that that process has been allowed to exist for as long as it has, which at this point now has been ex existing for almost a year. Um, what happens though when asylum seekers go to get this magical ticket from the INM is they are told, well, you don't have the right documents here for Mexico, so we can't give you this ticket, or you need to turn yourself into Mexican authorities and be in detention for a while, and then we're gonna give you the ticket. I, have, I don't know anyone who has agreed to that. Um, and a lot of people, uh, when they're told this, and they're undocumented in Mexico, you know, they come to me and they're like, that's completely insane, I'm not gonna put myself at risk there. Um, but again, I'm still not able to get through at the port of entry, so I'm you know, kind of just stuck. Um, so we, we accompany the refugees, we present um, to CBP via hand to a supervisor, and then we also email it to the supervisors. Um, just a really simple packet explaining this person is claiming fear, um, you know, please refer them for a credible fear interview, here's my notice of representation, um, and even still then, we're getting these I-867s, which Clara mentioned, coming back stating, person, you know, claimed no fear, you know, wants to work in the oil field in Oklahoma or something super specific and random. Um, so, you know, what we have is America's largest law enforcement agency, because it is the largest, routinely violating federal law and international law on a daily basis with such boldness that they feel um, completely okay trying to do this in front of counsel. Um, the situation following the election of Trump and, and you know, his entry into the White House has become increasingly dire. Uh, C 
CBP officers um, have now started threatening people who go to the port of entry, uh, me, um, <laughs> to be arrested by Mexican agents, um, being accused of alien smuggling. Um, so now I have to carry the alien smuggling statute with me and let them know that that's actually not what it means. Um, and you know, so now what we're doing is presenting asylum seekers in large groups um, and going with observers of conscience. Um, a lot of people from the church community, other human rights defenders and activists in Mexico, um, and we'll present, you know, anywhere between 10 and then, you know, on May 7th, we presented 78 um, refugees at a time. And with, you know, observers of conscience and the press, because when you bring all of those people, um, you know, it's a completely different response. Then it's like, oh, come into our asylum lounge. Would you like, you know, a granola bar or something? Um, you know, like everyone's rights are being respected. That's a statutory granola bar. Yeah, it's a, sta it's a statutory granola bar um, with a discretionary T. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it, it's a completely different response. But the point is, is that you shouldn't have to go to a port of entry with an attorney. You shouldn't have to go with a backup squad or a press um, because there's a lot of asylum seekers that, that don't have that access um, or you know who may not get referred to me. Um, I've had people who I've ended up you know picking up in detention because um, I like treat detention like it's a pickup spot, um, and they've told me like, hey, I tried to present at the port of entry three times and they wouldn't take me, and so I just had to cross you know illegally. I had to just you know hop the fence or try and cross through the hills. Um, and you know, going to those bond hearings is always really interesting because the judges will you know, say, well, why didn't you go to the port of entry? That's the process. And you know, at, at that point, I need to explain to the judge, listen, they tried. Um, this has been going on for quite some time, and I'll usually present data. Um, Vice News has a really great um, little segment about turnbacks at the port of entry where they have video of CBP telling two asylum seekers, no, 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 you have to go talk to Mexican immigration. We can't, you know, before you, you can come and talk to this, um, talk to us. And that footage was actually given um, by someone who later became my client, um, who is amazing. Um, but, you know, even with all that, I've had judges say to me, well, this has been going on for 25 years, you know, they just have to keep going back to the port of entry. So it really shows the complicitness of a lot of actors in the system that they all know that CBP is a rogue actor um, and has been acting outside the law um, and making claims, um, making judgments on asylum claims that they do not have the legal authority to make um, and falsifying um, federal federal documents um, that are uh, eventually used against clients in, in their immigration cases, as Clara mentioned. Um, and just the fact that all these actors are aware that this is happening is, is truly concerning. Um, and I, I, think, yeah, I, think that, I think that's pretty much it. It's very concerning. So I, I would like for everyone to come to the border tomorrow um, <laughs> and so that we can start delivering these people. Thank you, Nicole. Um, let me turn now to um, folks who've really been on the front lines of the family detention centers here in Texas, Dilly and in Carn City. Steve Schulman, pro bono worldwide partner of Aiken Gump, who I recall when we were just overwhelmed with the numbers of families that were being held at Carnes, we thought, well, let's let's call Steve and see what he can do and. Um, really within a week or two flew in uh, an attorney who worked for a full year at Carnes as Raiz has um, raised money, raised people, and put together an amazing team to really um, put together a, a really cr um, creative effort to find counsel and to put together impact litigation to face the challenges at Carnes and Dilly. So Steve Schulman and um, Mon Manoj, thank you very much for your efforts. Let me just ask you, what are you seeing in the family detention centers um, that you could compliment the remarks my colleague? Thanks, Anne. Um, thank you so much for, for having me, uh, for inviting me to speak with you guys. Um, so the work that Raices does is focused on the Carnes Family Detention Center, which is outside of San Antonio. Uh, about an hour southeast of San Antonio. There is another uh, family detention center in Dilly, Texas, which is southwest of San Antonio. Um, we work very closely with uh, other legal services organizations that are um, providing legal services at Dilly. Um, and then there's a third family detention center in Pennsylvania, 
which is significantly smaller than the two in Texas. Um, so the, you know, what we've been seeing from in, in the change of administration, um, there's definitely been significantly fewer people that are being detained at the Carnes Detention Center. It has a capacity for around 850 people. Um, and maybe two months ago, it was down to 100 um, uh, people detained there. Um, in the Obama administration, the numbers were regularly between 600 and 700. Um, and we were routinely hearing of people who had been turned around, turned back at the border, had to um, attempt to reenter several times over the period of weeks or months uh, with their children to try to get into the US. And then obviously have heard um, of other folks who have tried to enter multiple times um, you know, the right way by presenting themselves to uh, a border patrol officer and were prohibited from doing so and then turned around and came in iwi, entered without inspection, meaning they cross the river if they're coming through Texas. Um, and then they are apprehended and sent to Carnes at that point. Um, I think we're definitely seeing a tightening of, of many um, standards and, and sort of many things that we had taken for granted uh, sort of under the Obama administration. Um, family detention is sort of a, a significantly different than like regular adult detention, uh, mainly because um, there is a class action settlement agreement from 1997 from the Central District of California, which governs um, how ICE can treat children that are in ICE custody. So under that settlement agreement, children cannot be detained for more than 20 days. So the vast majority of the families, mothers with kids who are at Carnes or at Dilly, um, go through the expedited removal process, so go through the credible fear process, and then typically get released right around 20 days. Um, and that we, we are continuing to see that for the most part. Um, I do want to talk a, a bit about adult detention and sort of change it b before we get back to Carnes. Um, talk about adult detention and um, you know changes that we are seeing in the adult detention centers that um, our office works with. Um, I, I think we're seeing significant changes uh, in the current administration for sure um, that all impact a detained person's ability to seek asylum. Um, I think really the government's goal, in my opinion, is to make it as challenging as possible to uh, have someone basically stick it out in detention, to be willing to even apply for asylum, and then if they lose, to be willing to appeal. Um, so I, I think we're seeing much more of an emphasis on using private prisons, uh, which are private prison companies, I'm sorry, that are running civil immigration detention centers. Um, an interest in you know, opening detention centers or uh, increasing capacity at detention centers that are in very remote parts of the country, um, all of which affects access to counsel, which is really crucial for seeking asylum. Um, I think also one of the executive orders uh, called for a tightening on parole, which is one of the methods of release from detention. Um, the interesting thing about parole is that if a person pre presents themselves at a port of entry, so they're, they're entering the right way, um, they're not actually eligible for a bond to get released from detention. They're only eligible for something called parole. So parole, you put together an application, you submit it to your ICE officer, your deportation officer, um, which explains, you know, there's a couple of factors, proving your identity, proving you have somewhere to go, proving you're not a flight risk, et cetera. Um, the thing about parole is that if your parole application is denied, there's basically no recourse. An immigration judge has no authority to review that parole denial. An immigration judge can only consider bond. So somebody that presents themselves as uh, an asylum seeker to a port of entry and gets detained and put into expedited removal and eventually gets to the point where they can apply for asylum, if their parole application is denied, there's very little that they can do to actually try to get out of detention. They can't go in front of a judge to get them released. So by seeing a tightening of parole standards um, from the executive order, um, 
I think we're definitely seeing parole like routinely denied in the adult detention context. And um, you know, people are going to be detained. Uh, I think our anticipation is people are going to be detained for you know, the length of their case, which is really problematic as well. Um, and then one thing that has happened as a result of the executive order is this idea of visiting judges. So, um, you know, there's a lot of detention centers that are in the jurisdiction of the San Antonio Immigration Court. So there's detention centers in Laredo, there's uh, the family detention center in Carnes, there's also an adult detention center in Carnes, there's a detention center north of Austin. Um, all of these detention centers are in the jurisdiction of the San Antonio Court. And so what happened prior to the executive order is that all the cases from all these detention centers were heard by judges based in San Antonio. So your client was in the detention center and appeared over video, and your judge was in San Antonio, the, the trial attorney, the prosecutor was in San Antonio, and the lawyer, if there was one, could either appear sitting next to their client in the detention center, or you could appear in person with the judge in San Antonio. And then with the executive orders and an emphasis on you know, quick adjudication of detained cases, um, the immigration court system started this process of flying in judges from all over the country to each detention center and having the judges in person in the detention center um, hearing those cases in an effort to you know, sort of speed up the adjudication of detained cases. So now, for example, the Laredo Detention Center, um, you can't go to San Antonio to represent your client. You have to go to Laredo, to the detention center, because the judge and the prosecutor and your client are all in a courtroom in Laredo. So in theory, this makes a lot of sense because you lose so much over video and you, know, you want to be with your client to the extent possible. The problem is many of these detention centers are very remote. So getting someone to take a Laredo case was always challenging because it's like two or three hours from San Antonio. And now, you know, the fact that you can't go to San Antonio, you have to go to Laredo, um, significantly impacts who is going to be willing to represent the people at Laredo. But the other thing that's really, um, that's really uh, concerning is that the judges rotate. So you have judges from New York who fly down and they're at a detention center for two weeks and then they're gone and you have a judge from you know, the Atlanta court or the Miami court or someone else flying down. Um, and so the problem is like, you have no idea which judge is actually going to hear the asylum case, the asylum application. So the judges are refusing to rule on motions because that judge who might rule on the motion won't be the judge hearing the case. Um, so, like, nothing is really moving. And then um, we see judges change decisions. So, like, a judge today grants bond, and then the judge tomorrow is like, I don't think this person should have been granted bond. I'm going to revoke the bond. And then you have a judge two weeks from now who's like, that didn't make any sense. I'm going to reinstate the bond again. So it just makes no sense at all. Um, and all these judges are not necessarily familiar with the law in the Fifth Circuit because they're coming from other parts of the country. That may be a good thing, <laughs> which I think is a very good thing. And the interesting thing is that a lot of the trial attorneys are also flying down from other circuits. So it, it's just a compounding of pressure on the detainee um, to just give up and accept deportation. I think the other thing is we've heard rumors that the government intends to change um, detention standards, so the standards that exist are not always followed, but exist regarding the treatment and like the access that detainees should have to food and medical and things like that. Um, we've heard from a lot of people, we've worked with a lot of folks at like Port Isabel and Pearsall and detention centers in Houston who, um, you know, have an asylum case, they go in front of the judge, they have a, a strong asylum case, and then they lose. And they just want to give up and be deported rather than stick it out for an appeal. Um, and so, you know, all these factors are going to make it significantly harder to um, help detainees 
access asylum protection in the US. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Steve, who can talk about the work at Carnes. As Ann mentioned, Steve was an instru uh, Steve's firm and Steve were an instrumental part in setting up the work that we do at Carnes, which my office subsequently sort of took over the coordination of. So, thank you, thank you Manoj. Um, again, my name's Steve Schulman. I'm the pro bono partner at the law firm of Aiken Gump, um, which is uh, a firm that was born in Texas and in, in Dallas in 1945, founded by uh, now the late Bob Strauss, um, and uh, and so we have a lot of uh, both connections and uh, real passion for Texas and for um, helping out here in, in this community. Um, I myself am based in, in Washington. Um, what I want to do in talking about Carnes is, is use that a little bit as an example, um, but to give you some detail about how that all came together and maybe we can all learn some lessons from what happened at Carnes, and I'm gonna talk about Carnes um, only because I know it intimately, um, not because necessarily it's the only place that this has happened or even the most successful necessarily. There is a great project at Dilly called the CARA Project uh, that RAISIS is part of and the American Immigration Council. At Stewart, a new project has started with um, the incredible Steve Manning, who seems to be, I think, everywhere. Um, uh, Steve started the project at, uh, at um, Artesia, thank you, at Artesia, New Mexico, which was the first family detention in 2014. The first, not the first ever, but the first one that happened with the influx in 2014 of Central Americans. Um, and really that was kind of what was happening at Artesia was motivating us at Carnes. Um, so what happened at Carnes? Well, Carnes, um, uh, ironically, um, the first time I ever visited Carnes was I believe in late 2000 um, when it had opened as a model civil detention facility for adults, for single adult males. Um, it had opened and in fact was a model civil facility in that sense. I mean, again, putting aside whether detention is appropriate, at the very least it was mainly young Central American males. They had soccer field. They had very easy kind of access in and out. When I went, there was a soccer game going on and the people who weren't playing soccer were quite literally, and I mean literally, eating ice cream, um, sitting there watching a soccer game. Um, uh, but quickly in 2014, uh, over that summer, as you recall, there was an influx both of unaccompanied minors and adults with children, um, was quickly converted into a family detention center, essentially just painted with brighter colors um, and uh, and I think some of the units were changed a little bit, but, but for the most part, taken from a single, fa from a single adult to a family detention center um, with all the problems you can imagine happening. So what happens at this detention center is that about almost overnight, hundreds of families uh, and, and then total population of, as, as Manoj said, getting, you know, creeping up 400, 500, 600, individuals are there facing um, what Clara was referring to, which is the credible fear process, right? So the first process that happens after this detention is this interview by the asylum office, um, either by phone or in person, um, with the individual, uh, typically a Carnes then the mother, um, asking about their fear and a very kind of, a, compared to what happens at the border, a detailed interview. Not necessarily as detailed as we'd like, sometimes quite short. Um, but that is really the mother's, in the, in the case of Carnes, the mother's opportunity to make her case to be able to apply for asylum. So at that point, she can't even file an application. She has to explain. As Clara was, was mentioning, these falsified sworn statements can play a significant role in these credible fear interviews because that is the one document that the asylum office has. Um, so, uh, so this is what we were faced with, was women going through this credible fear process essentially alone and with almost no preparation or even understanding of what the process meant, what it was about. They thought it was court. They called it court often. It's not court. Um, there's no lawyer um, uh, present um, uh, unless you can have a volunteer lawyer uh, come in and be present. So we got a call from um, a good friend of mine, um, uh, Caitlin Goldfinch, uh, some of you may know her, 
Um, she worked at uh, what is now American Gateways and is now a private immigration lawyer in uh, Austin and say, can you guys come down and help us with a few credible fear interviews? Just kind of come down to Carnes. Um, that was underselling the project, to say the <laughs> least. Um, the great news was there were lots of organizations and people there who wanted to help. RAICES, which, which, is, um, which was the closest organization geographically, was at that point overwhelmed with the individual uh, unaccompanied minors at Lackland and other places and couldn't send somebody out. Um, so we went out and met, saw what the, what the problem was. Um, uh, Andrea Guten from Human Rights First, who's now here, was, uh, was, was there with us and came down. Uh, um, uh, Barbara Hines from University of Texas uh, came down and we all kind of brainstormed how can we, what can we do here? Uh, and we essentially started this project um, thinking about how can we, the first thing is, get these women through the credible fear process. Um, and so what that means is helping them to understand their story, to be able to tell their story, and then if we have the resources, going in and working with them, representing them at the interview, which really just means sitting there at the interview, listening and making sure that the appropriate questions are asked. One of the lessons from Carnes, and, it, and I say it right now because it, it is a, it, it's a lesson from the credible fear interviews, um, is just having a spotlight on it, having a lawyer present, even if, and th this goes a little bit back to what Nicole was saying, something Nicole said you need an army, not just a lawyer necessarily at the border, but having that presence actually made the credible fear process go, go better, even though in credible fear you're not acting as a lawyer in the sense of objecting or asking your own independent questions typically. Um, but what we saw was once we started to both prepare the women uh, for their interviews and then uh, accompany them to the interviews that the grant rate was going from somewhere around 30% of credible fear interviews uh, were resulted in a positive finding um, to about 80 to 90% um, in, in a matter of months. Um, the process from there and the way that this didn't happen overnight, although it happened relatively quickly, the process uh, from there and what helped this along is that if you, once you have a credible fear interview, uh, you do have then have a right to go to an immigration judge to have that credible fear determination reviewed if it's negative. If it's positive, you don't need it reviewed and there's no, it's, again, it's not an adversarial process, so DHS isn't trying to get it reviewed, right? So. Woman goes in, credible fear, positive, great. She goes on to, assign, to immigration court hearings that Manoj was talking about. Negative credible fear determination, they get a hearing before an immigration judge. Frankly, even though I had practiced immigration law um, and have been in immigration court for more than 15 years at that point, I had never done a credible fear review because typically that's not what, there aren't a lot of lawyers at the airports doing them and at other places and frankly, even though there are problems with the credible fear process, the grant rate was typically around 90%. I mean, the, you know, again, that doesn't mean that the 10% who are denied, that that's right or, or good, but, but when you're talking about a 30% grant rate, you really need lawyers in there. So we went in and would do the, uh, essentially, you could call them appeals or IJ reviews. Interestingly, those are completely non-adversarial too. DHS does not have somebody at those hearings. You go in, the judge, actually, there is some discrepancy about the attorney's role in that case. Some judges will let, and most of the uh, uh, San Antonio judges were pretty good about allowing uh, respondents' attorneys or the, the, uh, the women's attorneys to ask questions. Um, but, um, but for the most part, it's actually just a, like a second uh, credible fear interview. So the judge is interviewing and determining. We would, we would provide typically a short brief or memo that would explain the basis of the fear. Um, and we had uh, pretty good success getting those overturned. Um, eventually what happened by doing this was that the asylum office got the message that they didn't like particularly getting overturned. Uh, so their grant rates went up. We actually ended up even in circumstances where the asylum office was reconsidering its own decisions even before we went to the immigration courts. And again, we got up to close to a 90% uh, success rate. 
So what happens from there then is that you go to a full hearing, you can get bond as, just to emphasize again, because it, it, it's worth, it's so counterintuitive that it's worth repeating. If you go to the border, you're called an arriving alien, um, and you do it kind of the right way, you have no right to, to get out of detention. It's completely at the discretion of DHS. DHS says no, tough luck. If you cross the border, even if you just hop a fence, land on this side of the border, and then are apprehended, and I will tell you that, that the women who are crossing the border there are not looking to cross the border and you know, go up to Oklahoma or wherever. They are looking to get apprehended so that they can make their claim. They're looking for officials to say, I want to make a claim. Um, they get to apply for bond. So it's a completely screwy process, but, but that's what it is. Um, so the next part is then getting bond. And one of the things that was really helpful in the Carnes process is Raices, while, while they were kind of ramping up to kind of for the handoff from, from Aiken Gump having a full-time pro bono person there at the detention center to Raices being able to staff it, uh, they, they worked with the, with the local community with, um, in fact, a lot with the faith-based community to get a bond fund started so that we could bond women out. Um, so the bonds were being set anywhere from 2500 to even $8,500, $9,500. Um, one thing I will uh, say, it, immigration bonds, by the way, are 100% paid cash on the barrel head. Not, it's not what you think of as kind of a criminal bond where you pay 10% down. Um, interestingly, part of this process as well was, was several law firms and public interest organizations, Human Rights First, Tahare, others, meeting with the White House at the same time to talk about the family detention and policies. And one of the things that we were talking about this bond issue, that $8,500 for a bond for a Central American woman coming over is just unaffordable. Um, they said, well, that's not, you know, that's $850, like 10% bond, right? And so we had to explain to DHS that no, they can't finance the bond. And I actually wrote up a whole memo for them explaining this. Um, so, so what Raices was able to do initially, and then you know, eventually take over the whole project, was uh, work with the faith-based community and others to get this bond fund together. It was in the multiple tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, we actually would have nuns go post the bond um, at DHS uh, and be able to get these, um, these women out. Um, and to the extent that, you know, we certainly were not able to get every woman bonded out um, of detention, but that also uh, had a great effect on the detention center that they saw that people were able to get out. So even the people that weren't able to get out were relieved that people were getting out. Um, the other thing that was kind of amazing, I just, I hadn't thought of this in preparation, but as I think back on this, um, and, and this is something for those of you who work in detention, um, I, I never would have thought about it before, but when you have a detained client who's really smart, they can be your eyes and ears inside the detention center. We had some women who were just fantastic, and they would come back to us and say, so-and-so's credible fear was denied, can you help her out? Or this is what we're seeing here. And we were able to essentially almost use some of these women as paralegals um, inside the detention center. Um, and so, uh, so we are able, so, so that was another part of it, and I should give great credit to the women who were in the detention centers being part of this team, um, because they really made it successful for themselves and were able to get our information out, out there, which is one of the big challenges in detention as well. When you go to a detention center to represent people, you don't show up and DHS doesn't say, okay, here's our list of people here, who do you want to meet with? That's not the way it works. You need to somehow get the information from the, the, the people in the detention center need to either call, and there are 800 numbers they can call, or American Gateways was doing a weekly know, know Your Rights presentation, so they would meet with people, get their names, signing up, get back to us, but you can imagine what a process um, that was as well. Um, so that is kind of the initial kind of story of Carnes, is all these disparate actors, a law firm, um, multiple um, uh, legal services and human rights organizations and the community all getting together to work on uh, these 
various parts um, to make sure that we could, as best we could, and, and I will say I'm very proud of the successes we've had, but of course the failures is always, are always what gnaw at you, the people we weren't able to get out or weren't able to help. Um, but I think it is a good lesson and one we can apply, and we'll talk a little bit later about you know, at the border or at other places. Um, and one element I should mention, I'll, I'll go into it a little more in a little more detail later, but we also were able to leverage both our own firm and other law firms' remote capabilities. So to the extent, for example, when we do bond, one of the critical parts of a bond was somebody in the US saying, yes, this woman can get out and come live with me. Well, we were in the detention center all day. We couldn't contact, didn't have time. They, we couldn't have our cell phones in the detention center. So we would have people outside the detention center, whether they were in Atlanta or Washington or New York or San Francisco, call these witnesses, write up their declarations and get them back to us. So one of the things as a community we need to really think creatively about is kind of the disaggregation of the, of the representation so that you can if you are kind of at the border or you know on site, you're doing what's necessary on site and you've got a community of support that's doing all the kind of what I'll call back office stuff, right? The stuff you can do outside that's helping out. And I think that's, that's uh, a very positive message from, um, uh, from the legal community that we got um, outside of Texas. And I'm glad you mentioned that, Steve. Um, and so I kind of want to just ask the broader question now, you know, given these challenges of CBP really acting as a rogue um, agency of this kind of unofficial yet definitely um, pattern of coercion and cooperation between the US and Mexico government with get a ticket to ask for asylum. Um, and given what we're seeing in detention of really um, um, conditions until people just can no longer sustain the fight. Um, where do we put our energies? Where, where, sh where do we mobilize? Where, where, what is the best investment of time and resources when we think broadly about individuals securing access to asylum? And I, I just dive in anyone. Is it, a, is it a media strategy? Is it more boots on the ground? I need to go volunteer for you, Nicole. I really do. I, I can't sleep hearing um, uh, of the way we're allowing this complete lack of accountability at the border. But would just love to hear people's thoughts of um, where do we go from here? I, I did want to respond to the issue of asylum seekers being detained for just extended periods of time um, because there is no right to bond um, if they enter through the port of entry. Be for anyone who I know is not going to end up in a family detention center and they're not going to be you know, let out after 20 days, um, I end up filing immediately my notice of representation um, indicating that the person is indigent, it's pro bono representation, they have a Sixth Amendment right to counsel, do not move them from San Diego. Um, and I send that as soon as they cross into CBP and ICE in order to keep them in the Ninth Circuit. And in the Ninth Circuit, we have this wonderful thing called Rodriguez Bond um, where at 180 days, the, the court does have jurisdiction to rule on the issue of release. Um, so people know, um, you know, I'm likely going to be denied parole, but there is a light at the end of the tunnel, um, and I'm not going to be sent to somewhere like Atlanta or Stewart, where, you know, I will never see the light of day unless it's um, getting on the deportation bus. Um, so Yeah, that's a really good point. I think that the one thing I will say is that light at the end of the tunnel, even if it's distant, is very helpful for people um, in detention. Um, a, a couple of, of things that occur to me, Anne, that, that you know, where should we focus? I think one of the great lessons of the travel ban success was the collaboration between the boots on the ground people who fed in a lot of the information to the litigation that were going on. Um, and I do think we need to continue to um, on the one hand, um, this is not, you know, we're talking a lot about some of the new stuff that's going on. This has been a fight, you know, that's gone on during Republican administrations and Democratic administrations. We are seeing some new things. We certainly are, are probably seeing a, I think, uh, without a doubt, CBP feeling like the gloves are off and that they, they have even less accountability, um, although they were pretty rogue during the Obama administration well. 
Um, but I think, uh, I think one of the, the good things to come out of the travel ban um, and why I think politically it, it can end up being so damaging for this administration is that the administration has very little credibility um, in the courts now. Um, and the courts, I think, feel even more empowered. So um, I'm hoping that, that we can continue to push on the, you know, on litigation, um, you know, making, I, th I think there will be a lot of receptivity in the courts to examining what the executive branch is doing, not necessarily taking the executive branch at its word any longer. Um, and obviously all these groups need to be at working together and in collaboration to build that record. Um, but, um, and I think one of the interesting things might be, you know, working as well with the state's attorney general, even though immigration is not typically a state issue. Um, they may be, they were obviously very creative in the travel ban and are uh, great allies in this effort. Thank you, Steve. Uh, let me um, pick up on the state issue. Well, one of the things that I think unites the rest of the members on this panel uh, is that they are bringing light to dark places, literally. I mean, there are people, uh, I, I'm just gonna say this because I don't know if everyone knows, but the, the rise of family detention in 2014 was one of the huge disappointments of the Obama administration. Uh, coming into office, President Obama had closed previously existing <coughs> family detention facilities as part of this uh, more thoughtful and humane approach to, um, to detention. That, Carnes uh, originally was part of this idea of a truly civil detention system. Uh, so families who are coming to the border with small children actually received uh, notices to appear, basically uh, ser were served to appear at immigration court, and then were paroled from the border um, to go where they were going, to usually stay with family, and then to appear at immigration court to answer for their deportations, deportation um, procedures. The Obama administration has done, did so much to sort of construct the machinery that the Trump administration has now uh, inherited. And what I think um, the Border Rights Project and the projects that are working in family detention and, and now the project at Stewart Detention Center uh, really show us is the extent to which having people, having lawyers and others, other legal workers, people there who have contact um, with the with migrants and asylum seekers, is the is the key to begin to address these abuses. Because if not, uh, people can be, and this happens every day across the country, especially in adult detention. Um, people move through the system with no contact with anyone who's looking out for their best interest, um, and they're incredibly vulnerable to government abuse. And 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 therefore we've and we've also as we've all been talking about on this panel, we have some agencies that are really um, unchecked themselves uh, who are dealing with them. Um, so we need, uh, and that's where states can step in. Um, you know, the state of New York this, and the city of New York have created a universal representation program for people who are going through immigration court uh, in the state. Um, the state of California is considering making a similar investment uh, localities around the country have begun to dedicate funds for deportation defense. Everyone in your own city, your own state, in your own county um, can advocate for this uh, to create uh, funds to, to fund an, an army of, of lawyers and advocates uh, to make sure that people who are going through these processes aren't going through them alone. And that can happen without the support of the federal government or Congress that can be um, state funded and local funded. So I'd urge everyone to check out uh, those efforts. Uh, and I just wanna add to, to everything that everyone has said. I think in addition to you know the, the lawyers and, and the impact of litigation, I think there is very much a community component um, to all of this work and um, sort of, enraging the community, educating the community, and then giving them specific things that they could do to you know, take a stand and make their voice heard and their opposition to these practices heard, I think is really instrumental. One thing that we've done a lot in the family detention context 
um, you know, we're our Raisa's staff, many of them who are sitting in the back, um, are, are there every day in the detention center. And um, we use volunteers of all kinds. So teachers, doctors, social workers, many of whom are not connected to legal work of any kind. And they're there doing legal work that we train them on. But then they take what they've learned and they go back to you know, the medical community, the social work community, the religious community, whatever it is, um, to educate people that might be a little removed from what is actually happening. Um, and then of course the religious community uh, has, is very powerful and respected and is very concerned about you know, the treatment of detainees. I think the other thing, as Steve mentioned, you know, a lot of uh, when Carnes first opened, a lot of the moms were, were very angered by what was happening to them and sort of served as like de facto paralegals. Um, even after the families get released, you know, they, they want to be advocates. You know, we learn about resources from moms who have been released that we pass along to other moms who are going to those same communities. And, and there's been hundreds of thousands of people that have gone through the detention system in the past couple years that have been released, that are going through the court system. And, you know, connecting those folks uh, who have those personal experiences and can share them with their local communities um, impacts the decisions that states and local communities make, for sure. Can I just say, I, um, I really appreciate that intervention, and I didn't mean to suggest that no. lawyers should be at the center of any kinds of um, <clears throat> social change effort. I think that, on, on the contrary, lawyers should really be following the lead of those groups, um, so I really appreciate you saying that. Yeah, Raiz has taught me how to be a better lawyer. My first year volunteering at Carnes, they told me, have you spoke to the nuns? And I said, no. And the nuns interviewed me about my client and my client's need. They're like, we've got a guitarist for you. And I remember saying, pardon? Because I was explaining how a mother um, was having very difficult, uh, a supreme, incredible difficulty releasing her three or four year old child who had lost a good 18 pounds while being in Carnes. Um, and that, you know, for her to try to describe sexually what happened to her while clenching her child, I was just needed the information and it wasn't happening. And they said, we have a guitarist who will get that child away from their mother and you can create your affidavit. And so they brought this little team of support and I realized, you know, th this team is actually uh, critical. So I'm, I'm glad when we think about this community approach, we think about the multi layers of benefit that it brings, both to individual advocacy as well as just building a momentum of opposition and awareness that we can draw upon. Yeah. yeah. So um, I realize we now have 18 minutes left. And so if folks want to come up and ask questions, please do so that we can have a. I think I'll slide up to the front. Wonderful. <laughs> <coughs> I come from Nuevo Laredo. Last year we received uh, 28,000 deported people. Uh, we are next door to Laredo. Uh, as I much appreciate and I see all the work they've done here together in Houston, Laredo is out of the map. I don't see anything happen. I am not able to connect with anybody at the other side of the River, so I'm looking for and I cry out for help. I know Clara came there. Uh, we have several discussions with other people coming, but I don't see really the willingness uh, and try to work together in Laredo and Nuevo Laredo. So I went, uh, as Nicole says, uh, several times to the uh, gate uh, presenting more Central America. No? Heavy, as we were from back a few times. The only, a uh, very sad experience, the 18 year old that was sent back to the uh, Mexican authority, the 18 uh, was accepted, and the mother with the two little kids uh, were sent back. And so this uh, happened several times. The other thing, uh, the question I ask for illumination is, when I have a mother, a father, a family with two kids, we always there debating what is the best way to do it. 
is the mother going with one child and the father going with the other child. We know that going together, the four people, is more often to better. So what is the best way to do it? When one more question is, you know the Nuevo Laredo, since uh, January 12, uh, we have over 200 Cubans. And I have 85 of them in my house. Now we are down to 25 of them. Uh, we went up to 200 people in the last uh, several months. And uh, so in the last month, all of a sudden the Cuban, like uh, the Asian, decide to turn them into the American authority. So we have uh, the 300 have uh, been turned into the American authority. Only 10 women uh, has been released under our own. So the question, the fear with all the others that are there in Mexico is should I go to the American authority? Uh, unofficially, it's American authority or the immigration at the American consulate told us stay there for one year, and then most probably go back to Cuba, which is the fear for most of them. Some of them, uh, I do believe that they have uh, elements for uh, the cred credible fear, but not all of them. So that uh, is, uh, with all these people, we have a meeting with uh, human rights, now we are working, the, I don't know how you say it in English, but the med Medida Cautelares, uh, we already have a few meetings, next one is uh, on the 16th, and see how, so there's always there, we are there wondering what is the best thing yeah. to Giovanni, tell them. Thank you for those questions and coming from the Nuevo Laredo. Um, who might want to respond? One, maybe not the tactical questions on what's better, but on the larger issues. So, with regard to turnbacks at the border, um, which I'm sure you see a lot there, what we do um, is, you know, we present just a really short letter on letterhead stating this person is an asylum seeker. They request a credible fear interview under Title Eight, Section 1225 of the United States Code, um, and then we make sure that that gets emailed or faxed to a supervisor to start creating a paper trail and to cut off. The, the level of deniability at CBP um, and just confirming that it's received. Um, and when people are turned back, um, we, we try to go to the border with at least two observers um, and those people will write a statement about what happened. And then um, if they are turned back or um, you know the, the documents show that this person um, wasn't claiming fear, then we do, uh, we file an online complaint with the Office of Inspector General, which is just as simple as sending an email, and we attach those declarations. Um, and it doesn't necessarily help that client in that moment, but what we're doing is, is we're gathering, you know, tools for our arsenal um, that can be used later on down the line for broader advocacy efforts. Um, I don't know if in Laredo you guys are also going into, um, you know, all the shelters or some of the shelters and doing um, know your rights training for asylum seekers um, because I find um, once they're given some tools um, and told you know listen all you need to keep saying to that CBP officer is I'm afraid I want to talk to an asylum officer I'm afraid I want to talk to an asylum officer and just just keep repeating that and sign nothing <laughs> I'm like I, that's my default I'm like sign nothing unless they you're, you're talking to your family and you know you're going to be released um, and with that they feel empowered um, and they know, um, you know, listen, this, this officer can't, you know, beat me up like maybe an officer in my country did. Um, this officer can't take away my kids, even though they do tell them that. Um, and so that some of the threats that CBP will use in order to get people to withdraw their claim or to sign for their removal, um, the asylum seeker feels empowered. And then when they come out at the end, they're o they always say, you know what? They said everything you said that they were going to say. And then I told them these things and then they went away. Um, and they're just, you know, they're all pumped up. They're like, yes, I have rights. Um, and so I think that, you know, arming asylum seekers with the information about their rights is so important. And then also documenting the human rights abuses, because once you start documenting them, um, you know, the attitude changes a little bit at the port of entry. So they know at least when you're coming with them, they're like, oh, this person is going to, this person's going to cause problems for me. 
um, and potentially put some complaints in my jacket. And I'd be happy to send um, you some templates for um, boilerplate co complaints that we do. So because you know there's so many um, sometimes that can be overwhelming, so that you can get them out you know rapidly. And like I said, that you can do them over email. So we may only have um, time for one more question. Sorry, Bill, you're in the front. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you to each of you for doing what you uh, said about shining light into dark places. Uh, I have an observation and then a question, which is an expansion on Anne's question. Um, when I first started representing asylum seekers right after the War of 1812, <laughs> I, um, it was very routine to see someone from Ethiopia or Eritrea or the Congo present themselves at the border, ask for asylum, be paroled, made their way up to Dallas where our agency is. We found them a great pro bono lawyer, sometimes a not so great pro bono lawyer like me, and we represented them in immigration court. What this, the summary of what y'all just said is that landscape has entirely changed. And uh, I guess my question is, and then a challenge for all of us here, is we really need to be thinking about this very differently and much more creatively. And uh, you hit up on a couple of those ideas already, uh, but I'd like to hear more about that because we, we really need to be, uh, that's what we need to be doing in my, in my view. Thank you. Um, I think one big thing that we've gotten out of the family detention context is sort of like, for better or worse, kind of compartmentalizing sort of each step of the process. So like, we know Nicole's work, she has contacted us when she knows some of her clients have arrived at Carnes, and then we're there, and she's still the attorney of record, and we're supporting her and helping her communicate with her clients and the detention center and whatever, and then, you know, we're working to get the clients released. If something needs to be done legally that doesn't have to be done sitting in front of the client, like we try to place it remotely with some lawyer, some law student, someone anywhere that will do it. Um, and so we've, we've been trying to kind of develop a system where we are taking advantage of all the people that cannot come to San Antonio or to Carnes or wherever. Um, and, and I think it, it has been really successful in being able to use many more resources that are out there that can't necessarily get to where we're going. I think another piece um, that everyone can probably speak to is the importance of advocacy, the importance of documenting, the importance of filing complaints. We file CRCL complaints, civil rights and civil liberties complaints all the time, we document medical issues, school issues, all sorts of things um, to try to make people in DC aware that these things are happening um, and, and you know they need to be doing something about it. I think that the advocacy is an equally important part, component of the work, the legal work that we're doing. So, and I would say, Bill, to touch on what you said in terms of so many people now being turned away and being affected. I mean, one of the things that is different now at Carnes um, is when, when we went to Carnes in 2014, it was all women and children from the Northern Triangle. Now it's their Afghanis there, there are people from Romania, as you were saying. Um, and so it's the border has turned from, you know, maybe not just being a Latin American problem, but actually being a worldwide problem. And that hopefully we would be able to engage even more communities than just kind of the local communities, the Latino communities, but also all the immigrant and refugee communities um, and look at it as a broader refugee problem instead of, in 2014, it was really thought of kind of as a refugee problem, but in some ways a political problem that had to do with the gangs in Central America. And that's not really what it's about anymore. It is. Thank you, Steve, for that. Any last comments? I think um, a way that communities can can also be involved, uh, just responding to, to Steve about the changing demographics of people we're seeing at the border, is you know we need we need interpreters. <laughs> um, I speak Spanish, but you know I, we're we're getting a lot of French speaking clients from different countries in Africa, um, Creole speakers, um, and we need access. We need to be able to communicate with people. Um, interpreting can be done remotely, and it's just 
it's just I can't stress enough how needed it is. Um, I guess I'm just going to back up to where I started with this story about 1996 and say that we have an opportunity right now in this country to turn the detention and deterrence and criminalization-based approach to immigration on its head. And I think that's what we as a community need to do. We need to look at ways that we can not just resist uh, the, the way that the Trump administration is pushing more people through this broken and abusive system that the Obama administration also used, um, but think about how we can roll back those 96 laws, how we can change the framework, um, and keep our eyes on that even though things seem dire now. Um, change is not always linear, um, and sometimes events like the one that this country is going through provide enormous opportunities for huge steps forward. So let's of take advantage of those tweets and litigate and continue to get the courts to not take this administration um, seriously. So thank you all thank for you. your questions, time, and thank you.